All right. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the talk about the uh, Cilium BPF's kernel data path refamped. So uh, what I want to talk about is essentially four parts. One is the motivation on uh, what happened recently as an, as an incident in one of the user environments, which motivates this whole uh, talk. The next step is a little bit around context for uh, the TC object model and what BPF links are. Then the third part will go into the uh, refm design of the TC BPF data path. And the last one is the BPF link integration for it. So interference at pre one handle one. <laughs> for this, I want to give an overview uh, how Cilium's BPF data path looks like. So essentially we attach BPF into a lot of things. Um, you can see here the host and also a Kubernetes pod. Most of the programs we attach to are inside the host. Uh, the core data path in Cilium is based on TC BPF. That's where all the forwarding happens, where the, you know, policy is implemented, various other things. Uh, we also attach to the XTP layer on the physical devices, and we also use the socket rest layer uh, for the, you know, for the east-west load balancing in the socket layer. But the core of it is in the uh, TC BPF side. In general, Cilium assumes ownership of the, of the data path. So in Kubernetes, you have a so-called CNI plugin, which takes care of networking, and there's usually one main plugin that uh, does all of that. There's, there are also uh, CNI chaining options where you can, you know, where kubelet, which is a component uh, in Kubernetes, calls into multiple plugins and it works generally, but what they usually do if there's a minor plugin also attached to it, it will set up, you know, networking devices. It will move them into the target uh, network namespace for the part, and then it will typically address and uh, it will typically set an IP address or a route. Uh, but that's pretty much it. And then the rest, uh, Cilium is taken care of. It's attaching BPF programs uh, to it. In case of Cilium, so we, um, if you don't uh, have chaining, then Cilium does all of what I mentioned earlier, and it also installs BPF programs uh, as a CLS BPF instance in direct action mode with prior one, handle one. <laughs> and there are some options for more advanced users. If they want to, they can uh, set a different priority or handle, uh, but then, you know, all bets are off because what, whatever the program is doing that is running before Cilium, it could terminate the pipeline and Cilium may, might not see those packets. So essentially, if you have policy enforced in Cilium, this would be bypassed if something is going wrong uh, with the other uh, CLS instance. Right, so that should be well understood in general. Um, so one uh, tale from a recent, recently that we run into in a user staging environment, luckily it was only in staging, <laughs> um, was, an, was an outage. Uh, so essentially the user reported that, you know, clusters have been unhealthy, multiple parts, they run into a crash loop, um, and it wasn't clear whether, you know, it was workload or Cilium part, and, you know, um, something suggests that routing is going wrong or, you know, something on the underlying fabric. So we, we, we did some more debugging uh, together with the user and he said that, you know, pretty much he has the same configuration in Cilium and other versions where it's working. And the only difference in this environment was that there were nightly reboots, but the rest is pretty much the same. Uh, they deleted all the policy to make sure that there are no policy drops that could cause connectivity failures. And, you know, some nodes in the cluster were good, some others were bad. So after a lot of debugging, um, you know, it, it, it really turned out there were no failures in the agent log. Everything looked reasonably normal. And from the system, which is something where we grab, you know, all the comments that are useful for debugging in the system and we put them into a zip file, all the states looked reasonably normal. No packet drops and no issues from the policy angle. The routes look good and also nothing suspicious from NetFilter. So until we notice this, right? So BPF tool net saved the day <laughs> because we uh, were able to introspect what was going on. So Cilium is typically creating LXC devices. Those are weave devices uh, that we create for the pods. So there's like a one-to-one -one mapping. So that looks reasonable. We attach to CLS Act. We attach to the ingress and egress. That looks okay. And our programs that we install, they are typically called, like for the containers, BPF LXC. And we have two sections uh, called from container and to container, uh, where BPF programs handle the input and the, and the output. 
But then uh, those programs, they looked suspicious because they were not installed by us. We don't have anything that is named like this. And when we were, <laughs> like the, the first thing I tried when, when trying to find the potential source for it was searching on GitHub. So who, who names classifier egress security? And it turned out there was a result, uh, which was from the, from the Datadog agent. And actually this was really it. So this was, <laughs> this was the, the bingo moment where we saw that the agent was actually running in this user's environment, right? So what essentially was happening uh, that the third party agent was, you know, removing all the CLS BPF instances that we initially set up earlier. And it's exactly using the same priority one, handle one uh, that, that we had. And, you know, the Cilium agent uh, assumed everything is fine, but actually um, uh, it, you know, it was not. And removing the third party daemon set uh, and restarting the Cilium one, where it then reinstalls the program, everything got back to working state. Right, so that's the... <laughs> That's the initial motivation of the problem we want to solve, which is the ownership problem. Like, and uh, one way to do that would be BPF links. And I go a bit into more details what BPF links are. So BPF links essentially uh, represent an attachment of a BPF program to a BPF hook point, right? So it's an uh, abstraction on, on top of the BPF programs. They contain a, uh, a BPF program. They hold a single reference to make sure the BPF program doesn't go away. And uh, one interesting thing, which is, you know, in contrast to BPF programs, so the hook points, they do not reference uh, the BPF link. So the BPF link is only referenced either from the application or when you pin it to the BPF file system uh, to make sure it, it doesn't go away when the application exits, right? Um, the BPF link also holds metadata, which is specific uh, to the attachment. You can create it, update the program inside of it, detach it, and so on. So there are a typical set of operations that we have in BPF. And, you know, the application deals with the, only has to deal with the BPF link file descriptor after it did the setup. So after it installed the program and it created the link, but then it can close the program file descriptor because the link uh, has all of it. And it was there, it was uh, originally designed to explicitly uh, allow to prevent uh, the proc detachment on when, when the process exits, right? Because if you have a, a file descriptor, they typically get cleaned, up, get cleaned up as well. But when you pin it, the BPF link, then uh, that would solve it. Uh, for example, think of a tracing app. Uh, if you want to upgrade the app the, while the program keeps running, that's, that's possible this way. Um, it also coexists with non-link uh, attachments for various hooks and one of the key properties that um, are quite useful in this context as well is that, you know, BPF links, they cannot replace uh, other BPF links, uh, they cannot replace non-BPF links and also the other way around, non-BPF links cannot replace BPF links only, you know, if you have if you don't use a BPF link, you can, you can replace that with something else. So that's uh, important to keep in mind for later. There are currently nine uh, BPF link types that exist today. Uh, they're mostly relevant around uh, tracing and some of them in networking, but there's no TC BPF link. So now a little bit of context around the TC object model and how we could relate it to BPF links. So as probably most of you know, so we have a TC ingress and egress hook. Uh, there's like a, you know, like a fake QDisk, which is only uh, a container for various, you know, for a list of classifiers. They can be BPF, they can also be something else. Um, for BPF, we have the CLS BPF, the direct action mode there uh, means basically that we install a BPF program, as you can see in this case, uh, which does a bunch of things, and then it returns in, uh, like an action code directly. Uh, this is, you know, like the, the typical way you have classifiers is uh, down below. So you have a classifier. If something matches the classifier, you execute an action. And if it doesn't, you go to the next classifier, right? So that's like the old style uh, that we that is there for a very long time. Um, and the action codes is you have TC Act Unspec, which means you go over to the next program because, uh, you know, like you, you continue in your pipeline but you can also terminate it with various other action codes, either TC Act OK, where you either push the packet up the stack or down to the driver, uh, TC Act Short, where you drop the packet, 
or redirect where you're redirected to a different networking device, which is also what we make use in, in Cilium itself. And there are a bunch of other action codes, but they're not really relevant for, for BPF. Um, this is how it typically looks in, inside Cilium. So we just have really, really simple. So we have a, the TC ingress egress hook. We have the CLS act QDIS. We have one single instance of the BPF classifier with the program in it, and it returns uh, something where we then also terminate the pipeline. And this is also needed because we, as I mentioned earlier, we implement complex things inside BPF programs, such as you know firewalling, uh, load balancing, local forwarding, and so on. So you know the question is, how can we marry both together? And it's a bit you know it's a bit tricky because TC has its own object model which I just described and it doesn't really fit well together with uh, with the BPF with the BPF link right. So if you think of tracing, you know the the idea was to um, actually twofold. First of all, to safely clean up everything when you destroy the link and to to leave nothing uh, behind. And the other thing is to also keep it alive uh, when you when you have it pinned. Uh, the, the keeping alive part exists today with CLS BPF because you can just you know terminate TC or whatever loads it, um, and that still uh, keeps running. But there's no good concept around the ownership. Um, like going back to the you know original or all the discussions on the mailing list, it's actually interesting. So for you know Facebook folks, uh, the the whole motivation around uh, TC. Uh, BPF links is uh, around the safe auto detachment. So they run into an outage where an application crashed and it got rescheduled and then, you know, it, it, it left the CLS BPF instances behind. And then, you know, they drain resources from your machine or they were, you know, dropping packets. So the behavior turned out to be inconsistent uh, because of leftovers. And the other thing is, you know, like for for tracing, for, for K-probes, U-probes, it, it was kind of implicit and like, until it has been made explicit with the BPF link support for it. And really the, the contract uh, that the BPF link must provide here is to, uh, to guarantee that the BPF program will be executed. In the case of Cilium, it's, you know, it's, it's exactly the other way around. So, you know, we need some kind of flexibility. So in, in Cilium, it's, you know, what, what we want to do is to be able to upgrade the Cilium agent to a newer version while the BPF program uh, stays alive in the data path and while traffic can keep flowing. So you know, like, uh, so how, how how can you marry you know those two things together? So basically, the BPF link would kind of have to, you know, prevent uh, CLS BPF proc detachment, uh, you know, like similar with similar semantics from around the tracing, um, but it's not straightforward transferable because you know in the TC side we are not FD based, right? So. For example, the CLS Act QDisk, they could just wipe the CLS BPF instance and you know, everything is gone nevertheless. Um, and also the other thing is other classifiers around TC, they don't really fit into the picture because you know, B, uh, BPF is just one of them. Um, so it doesn't really fit well into TC internals. And just to show you, there was an, an attempt uh, earlier to, to try to um, Make it fit together, and it's it's kind of intrusive and kind of very specific to to BPF, where you have to touch TC core bits, which is a bit ugly. Um, so some additional thoughts. Yeah, I mean, like the motivation that I mentioned earlier is the safe ownership model for TC BPF programs in Cilium. So you know, like cooperation between BPF programs, it can be possible. I mean, through the TC Act unspec, but you really have to make it explicit. So you cannot have imp implicit. Uh, like an implicit um, cooperation where, you know, when both programs assume they own the data path, it's just not, you know, possible oftentimes to make them work together. So the BPF link should really act as a, you know, safeguard to potentially um, to protect those different components from stepping over each other. So with that, how does the RefM design look like. So if you take a step back, um, you know, like back in 2015, when we originally merged it, it was like, you know, it, it, at, at that time, it kind of fit. Uh, but nowadays, you know, the usage around BPF has skyrocketed. So, uh, you know, I thought, well, can we do actually better uh, today? So some of the lessons, you know, learned from the TC data buff, um, which are, you know, kind of obvious in, retro in retrospect nowadays, um, or that you know the relevant parts from the queue disk they are like an, on the actual queuing like the fq 
or F2 Coddle, and for the, you know, like those fake QDisk for the ingress and egress hook, they are mostly used around two things, I would say. Um, one is like, you know, oftentimes a slow path for the hardware offloads, such as the open switch, and then the other thing is also on the BPF side, where we really want to have a fast path. Um, from the user experience side, you know, the CLS BPF has been hard to use. Uh, LibBPF helped a lot with that. So, you know, like small extract, how you can program this today. So it really abstracted away a lot, but it's also not perfect because given there's no ownership model, there like the, the cleanup part is also um, not really fully clean because the CLS actuators, for example, you cannot remove because you, you don't know whether, I mean, it could be racy, right? So, yeah, basically requirements we want to have if you want to redesign it. So it should be FD based so that the BPF links blend in perfectly. Uh, it should be, it should have multi attachment, but it must be efficient. Um, the minimum, there should be minimal overhead uh, going into a BPF program. Uh, it should be easy to, to program and to consume uh, from an API perspective. And ideally we don't want to, you know, add yet, get more hooks to the networking stack and it must uh, support a migration path, you know, where people still use old style CLS BPF and, you know, they want to migrate over. Uh, and the TC programs ideally should not, uh, should not be changed. So they should be supported as is. And, you know, this is what I came up with. So you have essentially the TC ingress egress point. Here you have a small array and then you can call like all the side here on the right is still the old style. So there's no change in behavior or semantics. But what you could do is you could, you could add additional en entries and you could attach um, BPF programs into it uh, through this you know, new style of attachment, which would be FD based, right? And if that BPF program does like a TC act unspec, it will continue in the pipeline and continue with the, with the old style uh, QDisks and, and classifiers, right? Just as the, in, in, the, in exactly the same way like the, the old uh, TC framework does. So you can you know, add multiple of those but what you also can do is if you, if you don't use any of the, of the old style TC stuff, you can just terminate and that's it. So the, the attachment here is through BPF net, uh, ingress and egress. So I, uh, this is through the BPF system call. That's what I implemented. And uh, net of, uh, like the, the data path side, the, the code in here looks as follows. So you, I'm just taking the ingress as an example. So you have the schedule um, handle ingress. So that's as is, and now the, the new implementation essentially, um, you know, runs, runs a bunch of BPF programs and really only handles the essential TC uh, return codes. And the uh, sket run procs just looks like this. It's just a simple array, which is then also, you know, more cache friendly. And if there's TC unspec, we go over to the next one. If, it, if, if there's not, we terminate the pipeline and the old style uh, TC basically also blends into this uh, by having, you know, by being one of the elements that we have in this array that we can call out to. So like for comparison, um, you know, from the entry point with the old style, we go into TC classify. Inside there, we have a list of the various classifiers and then we have this indirect call to classify. Then we go into CLS BPF as one example. And there again, we have a list of BPF programs and only then we go to our actual program and execute it. Worst case, even we have to do an allocation on the, on the return path if there's like a TC Act unspec, um, which is not so great, but that's what is there um, today. And with the new style of attachment, uh, you just go into the run procs, you go over the array, you, you run the and execute the programs and, and that's it. So we, doing a micro benchmark, uh, we were basically able to half the cycles needed for you know, just going to a BPF program, having a verdict. Um, of course, that's all when you know, cache is hot. So I would uh, assume the diff would be bigger when it's not hot in the cache. Um, and yeah, how does it look like from a, from a user API? I also did the implementation in libbpf. So essentially you have an if index uh, and there's a priority. Priority can be zero, which is pretty much similar to, you know, the old style TC where it would then auto allocate the priority or you set it explicitly. Um, and then you have BPF proc attach ops where you specify the file descriptor, the if index, the location, and then, you know, your, your additional options 
where you want to replace something or not, and your priority. Same for query, you can query uh, at the ingress or egress location of a given net device in your network namespace, and then you can gather all the information related to it. And the, and the output is essentially that you get back like a program ID, uh, here a link ID, I will go uh, into this a bit later, and then the priority. So you get the list of programs attached to that. And the detachment is also pretty simple. So you just uh, specify the priority, the index and the location, and then um, it gets uh, removed again. So essentially like this um, FD-based uh, uh, data path, you know, now that we have it, uh, it we, we can implement BPF links on top of it. Um, it also allows for like, you know, like an initial migration path for application because uh, before they implement all the link management in the later step. And this multi-attach uh, array that I mentioned, it's right now I, I picked a 32 slot each uh, because you know if you have more than that, it will probably slow it really down, but it can be made dynamic. It has the same priority concept as the rest of TC and the outer allocation and the, you know, the TC action codes and the semantics are also pretty much uh, the same. And for the for the ingress and CLS act, they basically use the same API internally from within the kernel. So the integration with BPF links as the last topic. Um, so from the kernel side, they are then supported for the new FD based uh, TC BPF data path. Uh, they contain the you know like a TC link object for BPF uh, contains the device priority uh, and location attributes. Um, they implement the attachment, the atomic update, and the detachment, and you know they solve this initial problem of the ownership that I mentioned in the introduction. So um, that's essentially how it looks. And from the from the libbpf, I added two new you know uh, TC sections. One is for the ingress and one for the egress, because then we can also map this to the to the two new uh, enums that we use. And the BPF link implementation for that looks also really straightforward. Uh, so we specify again the if index and the priority. And after we load a skeleton, um, but I mean that, that's for libbpf, for others they don't have to. Um, then we have a BPF program attached TC API where we just specify the individual program with the if index and priority. We get the link object back and this can be you know, cleaned up naturally. So yeah, that's it. Um, I have a POC code with everything I talked about in here in the private branch and cleaning it up. And um, yeah, goal is to send it out sometime around next week. So yeah, thanks. Uh, and yeah, any questions? So um, you said you had an array of programs. So you're still doing like the indirect calls into each program? Yeah, I mean, for for BPF, you have this anyway, the the indirect calls, right? I mean, yeah. like from from this array to the program itself. Yeah. But would would it make sense to like for XDP, we have this generated trampoline stuff, so you get rid of the indirect calls. Like you can basically generate the array thing as direct calls that loops through. Mm -hmm. Would be possible, but then the problem is right now. I mean, this needs to be supported on all architectures, right? We, we could do this in the, in the future, but, uh, you know, like, I, I, I didn't see, you know, a straightforward way initially, at least. Oh, okay, so, but it could be a performance optimization. Just it could be, yes. Product. I mean, it, it doesn't prevent it. I mean, the, from the user API perspective, it would be the same, right? And, and I, as far as the, the API is concerned, I think it makes a lot of sense. Can we have the same thing for HTTP, please? Like the can, can we do the same thing for XDP with oh. the uh, multiple priorities? <laughs> Probably, yes. <laughs> that was exactly my question. Like, it feels that, like, if we adopt this concept for PC, like, we can do the same for XDP and just say, well, <clears throat> I, I would be, as, as someone who has implemented this in user space with a libxdp, I would be in favor of moving it into the kernel. But this, mm. It's basically the same uh, yeah. concept that we're doing. So that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. It, it could be used for sure, yeah. I mean, the one thing we probably have to get rid of is like this, uh, this, this branch funnel that we have, like the, 
the branch generator from Bjorn. That's the trade-off. Um, but, but not necessarily. That could be replaced with the generated trampoline. Yeah, yeah, probably. And we could share that code between TC and HTTP. Yeah. So uh, I have some, a different question. So why are you still calling it, like in the code, you're still calling it a scheduler? There is nothing scheduler in that, like SCH, I'm assuming is scheduler, right? Yeah. And why are you still call it TC? Like, why is it all DC? It's nothing to do with DC, right? It's. I think like the, I mean, most people have it these days as a mental model, right? I mean, yes, it has nothing to do with DC, but it's like the, the whole layer that we talk about. So we have XDP layer, TC layer, and socket layer, whatever, you know? So I think, yeah, you know. But like, can we call it SKB layer? So we have like XDP, which is like packet-based frame, and here like SKB. So that's the first thing like SKB does, and well, maybe, Call it a SCB layer because that's kind of what it is. It's not this. Well, TC, TC has so much like <laughs> legacy, including like all, all of the opcodes. Like, can call it TC. I don't mind. It's just like it feels like if you're doing like a clean slate like design, and like we can preserve all of the like action codes to be like compatible, but instead of calling it TC act unspec, call it whatever. SKB drop or like mm -hmm. SKB yeah. redirect, SKB pass, well, because that's what it's doing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, like just the, an idea. The, like yeah, yeah. TC also kind of makes sense, like not <clears throat> to confuse people because it's exactly the same, but still just schedule or in TC. That, that could be some more unification between TCP, and, uh, sorry, HTTP and TC here as well, right? Have net ingress HTTP, net ingress. FKB, TC, something, so, but like the attachment could be pretty much the same. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I mean, the one thing maybe like, how do you then call the, <laughs> I don't want to, uh, you know, like how, how do you call the C group ingress egress thing where we uh, have an SKB hook, right? Yeah, C group, so, but... C group is KB, but they like, they will have a C group <laughs> prefix, so it's not okay. the biggest, but... Yeah. So, oh, by the way, one one small comment, like about this TC act shot and all that stuff. We should probably start defining them in as in arm so they get into vmlinux.h and you don't have to like pound define all that stuff. So, but uh, actually, what I wanted to mention that uh, would it make sense to support cookies as well there? So, like, imagine you have like the same cookies. sort of uh, BPF program that controls multiple interfaces, right? Mm -hmm. uh, by attaching the same program, just specifying that this is interface one, one, two, three, and all the stuff, and then fetching that's true. That makes sense, right? I mean, like you, yeah. a new program. So it's... That makes sense. Yes, I agree. I've seen you do priorities again, isn't it? You, you mentioned on the first slide that you've got into the problems because of that. Should we maybe uh, do something similar to what we have in C groups, where you can, when you attach the program, you say, my program plays nicely with others, so the others can either override me or they, they run all together, right? We have in C group, we have this chaining. Should we also have something here saying like, oh, I want to be exclusive program that owns this interface, or I know I can play nicely with the others. And I mean, if you know you can play nicely, then you don't have to specify a priority, right? You just let it out allocate and you just need to make sure that you have this uh, TC act unspecced or like SKB continue, whatever you call it, right? I mean... But I guess the, the, the problem, I, right, you have, you have this, one data daemon said that wants do something, and then you have Celium. Yeah. I don't think this solves it, right? They still, it, no, they still ordering, I think, still. I don't think you can fully solve it because, like, there are different teams. You know, they implement different programs, and maybe some of them expect ownership, others not. You actually have to talk to each other to really make to make something work because you have all the actions where you want to drop or where you want to redirect. So it's not really possible, I would say. But yeah, and playing nicely with others can also be unilateral, right? You can have a program that can work with Cilium, even though Cilium doesn't think it can work with it. If it's just something that monitors the packets by becoming an That's account, possible, so. yeah. Yeah. So you like if if you make it up to the program and say, I am exclusive, everyone is going to say they're exclusive. And we really need the operator to be able to override this and say, No, I have this monitoring program that I need to run before that. Mm -hmm. 
by default, but you can say maybe not with link. It might be by the only if the links are used though. Yeah. Thank you.